Hello, and welcome back to the Full Cast and Crew Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Silo. I'm thrilled to be back with you. Returning to the sweet spot of the podcast's sphere of interest, 1970s new Hollywood films, crime films. I am firmly back in the embrace of all that I love here about cinema. I've taken a brief detour in the last few weeks doing some episodes about current films in terms of Killers of the Flower Moon, which I hope you've all seen, and doing a few diversionary episodes where I go down rabbit holes such as actors making phone calls in films and all of the scenes of Philip Seymour Hoffman in Charlie Wilson's War. But today we're going to return to form, and I'm excited to do so. The Occasion is a film I had an interesting relationship to. It's 1973's The Friends of Eddie Coyle, a widely admired, deeply beloved by those who love it, neo-noir crime film set in Boston and directed, interestingly, by the British director Peter Yates. I've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole, a Peter, Peter Yates rabbit hole in preparing for this episode. And I'm so glad that I did because... Much like Ted Kotcheff is a director I admire a lot who worked in a variety of different genres, Peter Yates has made so many fascinating and interesting films that are completely different from each other. The Friends of Eddie Coyle is a very realistic feeling, no bells and whistles, very little exposition, very little explaining to you, the audience, what is going on and what terminology means what it's a crime procedural now peter yates has said that the friends of eddie coyle which stars robert mitchum and a host of who's who 1970s film that guy actors peter yates said that this is one of his three favorite films that he's ever made the three favorite films are the dresser starring albert finney Eddie Coyle, which we'll discuss today, and Breaking Away, which is also a Peter Yates film. Now, another Peter Yates film, which I really, really liked, and I watched only because I learned of it in preparing for this episode, is a one of his early films, which he made in London in 1967. It's a film called Robbery, and it stars Stanley Baker, uh, and it's kind of a modernized version of the the great train robbery, uh, the, the famous story of what I guess the 1963 great train robbery, uh, robbing of the Royal Mail train. And it is a brilliant, brilliant crime procedural film and a police procedural film. It's got oodles of 1960s Brit cinema style. And it has a centerpiece car chase, which is the reason that Peter Yates was chosen to direct Bullet, the Steve McQueen starring legendary, iconic San Francisco cop crime thriller from 1968, I want to say. Bullet is. Let me check my facts here. Yes, 1968 is Bullet. So Peter Yates having come up in the British television industry and having made a couple of uh, films was tapped to make this, this most American uh, crime film bullet with the most American of film stars, Steve McQueen. And he was chosen largely because of the success of this film robbery, which is not widely available. I had to purchase it on physical media but it's really worth searching out. I promise you, you will really enjoy it. It's brilliantly photographed. It's production design, it's commitment to realism and truthfulness in terms of its locations. It's entirely shot on location, like many of these Peter Yates films. It's one of the strengths of Peter Yates as a director. And um, so Yates has these, these bona fides that that belie kind of his erudite Britishness when you listen to him talk at the time of making films like uh, The Friends of Eddie Coyle. Now, I've tried to watch The Friends of Eddie Coyle many, many times over the years. And 
again, I've been having this experience a few times on the podcast where because of doing the podcast and watching so many films as a result of going down various filmic rabbit holes as I do here, I end up having maybe enough frame of reference to educate myself. My dumb mind opens up and is able to understand and access something that previously kind of went over my head. Not that The Friends of Eddie Coyle is some brainy, naughty thriller. It's really no, nothing of the sort. It's just that the Friends of Eddie Coyle is is almost alone in films that I can think of that is so faithful to its source material novel that it gives it this very unique um, feeling. And the way that it unspools is so committed to following the George V. Higgins novel of the same name that it's not that it's hard to get into. It's just that you are plopped into Boston of the, you know, early 70s and the small time criminal underworld, which is one of the other things that really separates this film from a lot of others in that in The Friends of Eddie Coyle, there's not millions of dollars at stake like there is in Robbery, the other film I just mentioned. There are not $30 million at stake like there are in The French Connection, another connected film of this era. These guys are robbing banks and getting away with tens of thousands of dollars, maybe collectively over the course of the robberies that are discussed in the novel and the film. The Friends of Eddie Coyle, I think the figure is $235,000, something like that. The stakes are so small and the players are so small and that's part of the charm of this unique and incredibly vibey film. It's got the most, it might be the most 70s film I could think of because it has a commitment to studied realism as opposed to even in a film as great as The French Connection, as iconic as The French Connection is. You know, The French Connection has some stylized elements to the storytelling Go figure, William Friedkin. It's actually, in retrospect, the most tamped down Billy Friedkin film of them all. And in that regard, it's probably his most straightforward and accessible film. But it does have some flourishes. And I'll talk about those in a minute. But it's amazing that Yates doesn't mention Bullet as among his three favorite films, because I think Bullet alongside Friends of Eddie Coyle, is one of the very best crime films of the 1970s. And in a way, wait for this hot take, as a piece of filmic storytelling, Bullet is better than The French Connection in some ways. Now, the car chase in French Connection is better. It's in that it's more unique. It starts on foot. It has the perp and the cop traveling via two different means in the train and the car following the train. It has a propulsive, incredibly captured energy that really has never been equaled in terms of its influence and iconic stature, even though, as I've said before on the podcast, and as you can hear in my episode about To Live and Die in L.A., another Billy Friedkin film, I think technically that car chase in To Live and Die in L.A. is technically superior to the one in The French Connection, but The French Connection is the most iconic car chase in the history of cinema, and probably always will be, and for good reason. But the car chase in Bullet is pretty iconic in its own right. It's usually mentioned in second position in terms of The French Connection to greatest car chases. It's different because it's San Francisco set. We'll talk about that in a second. Now, I just want to go, I'm, I'm stopping down a little bit on Bullet because I think it sets up some of the things that are important in terms of Peter Yates as a director. Um, Bullet, as you may or may not know, it stars Steve McQueen as the cop named Frank Bullet, however improbably. Now, the rumored model for Frank Bullitt was, of course, uh, 
uh, to- Joe, uh, what's his name? Toski, uh, Dave Toski, who is memorably paid by Mark Ruffalo in David Fincher's brilliant, also San Francisco based crime film Zodiac. And it also stars a who's who of co-stars, a who's who of brilliant seventies, that guy actors, including Robert Vaughn, who in a nice little twist plays kind of the villain (laughs) of the piece, even though he is of the establishment, which is an interesting part of many of these crime films of the era. Robert Vaughn's smooth talking, I don't know if he's like going to run for attorney general or senator or something, but he's basically this uber powerful macher in the city. And he threatens and conjoles and tries to bribe everyone in his orbit equally. And what's interesting to consider Bullet and the Friends of Eddie Coyle and the French Connection is how different our protagonists are in those three films. And you could reduce that and say, well, it's the difference to a Steve McQueen and his screen persona, a Gene Hackman and his screen persona, as evidenced by Popeye Doyle in The French Connection, and Robert Mitchum and his screen and off-screen persona. Probably of all of these actors, they are the most mingled in Mitchum, who's kind of boozy, boozy worn out, uh, tough guy thing is pretty much the same on and off screen as you read it. Whereas McQueen, you can read, you know, he's got a little bit more intellectual pretensions. Sometimes Hackman is just more of a once in a millennia talented every man actor who can, who can do and has done everything there is to do in a career that spans probably 60 or 70 years at this point. Here's a little clip of Steve McQueen doing battle with the aforementioned Robert Vaughn. The organization, several murders, could do us both a great deal of good. Look, Chalmers, let's understand each other. I don't like you. Come on now, don't be naive, Lieutenant. We both know how careers are made. Integrity is something you sell the public. You sell whatever you want, but don't sell it here tonight. Frank, we must all compromise. Bullshit. Get the hell out of here now. And in that brief clip, you can hear the alchemy that made Steve McQueen the star, the brooding presence on screen that he was. In Bullet, McQueen is super competent. He is the center of the cop world that he occupies, even even to his superiors, it should be noted, who, even if they really dislike him, such as the brilliantly, I would say, against type Norman Fell, Uh, but he's not so much against type from what you may be familiar with from Three's Company as much as he's pre-type here because he's kind of the heavy here. He's he's a cop heavy. He's a bad cop who is trying to put the screws on Bullet. But even he and even Bullet's boss, uh, played by Simon Oakland, are deferential to what is apparent even to them is Bullet's incorruptibility, his professionalism, his sense of calm. It's the, it's the inner calm with a raging sense of what is right and wrong and justice and injustice, which is what McQueen leads with in Bullet. And you can contrast this with the absolute live wire exposed nerve end of Popeye Doyle in The French Connection. It could not be two polar opposite police officers. They could not be two polar opposite actors. 
And they are both used to great effect by their directors in these films. And it's fascinating to watch Bullet because it's one of those films that has, I think, a reputation that tends to dwarf actually how well-crafted a film it is. You know, I always kind of thought of Bullet uh, as, you know, just another uh, kind of San Francisco shoot 'em up cops and robbers film. It's, it's much, much more than that, as all Peter Yates films are. You know, it starts from the attention to detail, the commitment to reality and real locations. And it extends, in the case of Peter Yates, I think, to the casting of every small part in the film, which is actually a strength for both the Friends of Eddie Coyle and Bullet when compared to The French Connection, which to me suffers a bit from some of the, some of the ancillary casting, the smaller bits. Um, there are places where Friedkin uses non-actors, like in the New York City cop garage guy who's taking apart the car looking for the drugs in The Wrench Connection. He's clearly a real guy. He probably actually has that job. And he reads that way and and indicates such on screen in a way that, that really works for the film. But I think the casting of these uh, Peter Yates films, top to bottom, is just superlative. It's one of the joys of watching his films, as well as watching how he uses real locations wanted to play a little Norman Fell because I thought as a kid who grew up in Three's Company, it's kind of funny to see Norman Fell be heavy. What the hell is going on here? A high Don pursuit. Gordon. Two men are killed, an officer in the hospital, a witness almost murdered. Now, I want to know what's happening and I want to know now. Let's hear it straight. Here's a report. Now, a man like Chalmers could be a great help to the department. That's Norman Fell. He could speak for us where it counts. He could fight for us in the legislature. Now, you have got to turn over his witness. Where's Ross? Tell him. That's an order. He's dead. Dead? He died last night. After you moved him? Before. I've got him downstairs under a John Doe. Now, you are sick. Smuggling a dead man out of a hospital? And now two men killed who may have had nothing to do with it. The man I was chasing killed Ross. How do you know? Did you see him? Yes, he tried to nail me with a shotgun. A Winchester pump. The radio report said the two men were burned beyond recognition. Now all he's got are two dead men. It would never hold up in court. Got one lead. I want to move on it. Miss Dorothy Simmons, Thunderbolt Hotel, San Mateo. Ross called her person to person from a phone booth in Union Square. Approximately nine hours before he was killed. So he called his girlfriend. What does that prove? This is Sunday. I'm going to hold that written until we come to work Monday morning. Now, okay, we're in a cop film trope thing there, which is like you got <laughs> you got 24 hours or 72 hours to wrap this thing up. Otherwise, I'm going to pull the rug out from underneath your feet. I don't know if that's ever happened in the history of policing, but maybe. But when you watch Bullet again, which is widely available, and I highly recommend checking it out, watch this scene and others for two things. One Steve McQueen's command of film acting, many of the subtle plot points that are happening in this scene that I just played you are not things that you can hear in the dialogue. They are the way that McQueen uses his eyes to look at or look away from someone who is asking him or telling him something. Similarly, watch it for how brilliantly Peter Yates stages a conversation between four men in a small enclosed office and how much subtle information he's able to uh, put forth through his use of where people are positioned in the frame. And in this ending part, after 
Gordon gives McQueen the time to wrap up the investigation. We can see on his desk the framed photo of his wife. We've met his family previously. We know he's a good man. And Norman Fell is his black-hearted counterpart, who is also a person of power in the police department, but is craven and seeks the, the power that the Robert Vaughn character offers. Bullet is the only one who is really committed to doing what the job should be about, which is getting the actual bad people that have committed crimes here. As such, McQueen exudes this moral force without excessive verbiage. He is a movie star in the ultimate respect in that regard, in that on camera, his face, his physiology, his countenance, his physicality somehow conveys all of these things wordlessly. And no actor, perhaps, before or since, has had such an innate understanding of his own strengths and weaknesses as an actor and has put them to such great use as Steve McQueen does in Bullet, which I think is his greatest film. Um, just another thing about Bullet before I move on. What's interesting about the Bullet car chase, which, as I mentioned, is often mentioned in second position in terms of greatest car chases of all time, What's interesting about it is in addition to making distinctive use of San Francisco and the city locale of the streets, and of course, I think the thing the film is most known for in terms of the car chase is that the cars are going up and down the incredible hilly landscape of uh, the city of San Francisco and as doing such, the cars catch air and smack onto the ground. And so you have this kind of unique porpoising effect that's different than almost any other car chase that happened before it. But it also um, reminded me that the car chase gets out of the city and is, re and is unique in that regard. It gets out into the kind of coastal countryside of San Francisco in a way that's kind of cool. And much of the, uh, much of the, the, the summation of the car chase takes place not in the city of San Francisco, but it takes place out in these coastal pastoral areas, which, is, which makes it kind of interesting in Newark. Now, another thing that I love about all three of these films and certainly in the car chases in French Connection and uh, Friends of Eddie, well, no, in Bullet. There's no car chase in Friends of Eddie Quill. But what I love about these period films is all of these films are filmed in an era where a couple things are working in concert together to give us kind of a unique only of the era moment, which is that as we get into the 60s and the 70s, really for the first time, we're we're, we're seeing more films that are made out on location, not in a studio, controlled studio environment of Hollywood. As we get into new Hollywood, commitment to, to reality, to, to feeling of the moment means that filmmakers are venturing out into places they didn't historically film in. And also given in these three films, particularly, the generally low budget nature of what we're talking about. It means that these directors, who are all kind of rogue, renegade, run and gun, do what we have to do to get the shot kinds of guys, means that you can always see people in the background of the shots of these films reacting to the existence of the film crew. And I love that. That doesn't take me out of the film. I actually think it brings me further into it. And also when there's driving and smashing up of cars, you know, nowadays, the degree of control over locations is so complete. It's such an industrialized, corporatized business that we've really lost this feeling of real people in the middle of these scenes. And there's some stunning moments in The French Connection and in Bullet where you're noticing people noticing the cameras. And to me, this adds vibe and feeling to the proceedings in a way that I really like. Now, if I had a peeve with The French Connection... And as I said, I think Bullet is a better film than The French Connection. The French Connection is more influential, it's more iconic, but it's a better piece of film storytelling in Bullet than I think there is in The French Connection. If I had a peeve with The French Connection, 
It's that the chase is so dynamic and so out of its own mind. And it's the uh, clearly the action centerpiece of the entire film that once it's over and it's concluded with the iconic shot, no pun intended, of Popeye Doyle shooting the Frenchman at the top of the subway stairs. And then we have to go back to the plot of the film. It's kind of like we've been taken out of this film and put on this insane, you know, nearly 20 minute joyride of a car chase, an adrenaline soaked, just n- nouveau piece of filmmaking that had never been seen before. So you then go back to the plot. <laughs> it, it takes some getting used to. And in fact, I found it, it didn't really re-engage me until we got into the police garage where that mechanic character is realizing collectively with Popeye and Russo that there's 125 pounds that aren't accounted for in the car. The drugs have to be in the car. And he says, I took the whole thing apart except for the rocker panels. So then they, they have the, the mechanics of removing the rocker panels and finding the drugs and putting it back in. That's when I got re-engaged in the film because the procedural element of what's going on finally engaged me. But before that, there's sort of like some scenes where I think you're still recovering from the car chase. In fact, I think Friedkin uses a repetitive scene almost to help us get back into it. There's a scene where some joyriders have stolen the car and Doyle tosses the joyriders much the way he did all of the people hanging out in the bar earlier when he stages this fake scenario in order to meet his informant. So you kind of have this repetitive scene. You've seen Doyle doing this before. You've seen him acting exactly like this just 20, 25 minutes previous in the film. The car chase is so dynamic, it's so insane in the French connection that it sort of actually stops everything. And to restart it is a bit tough. Now, Bullet's car chase is a little bit more tied to the actual mechanics of the plot. And the events of that chase, which you just heard in that scene with Norman Fell talking about two guys are dead, The events of the chase inform what Bullet can and can't do as a result as a cop. And the pressures that he faces as a result of the chase's outcome are also very much a part of the mystery, which is at the center of the film, Bullet. And there's a really cool mystery at the center of Bullet that I'd forgotten about. So to me, that chase is more organically woven into the film. But the French connection car chase, as I said, is the most iconic car chase in movie history, and rightly so. As I mentioned, the way these characters are different from each other, if you take this as a trilogy of iconic 70s crime films, Popeye Doyle, The French Connection, so dramatically different from Bullet, you can't imagine Steve McQueen's Bullet ever allowing himself the emotional mess that is Popeye Doyle's life. Popeye Doyle, the live wire, the haywire, a hair trigger, liable to go off at any moment in any direction. He's barely even a cop. He's more outside the lines of the law than the criminals he's chasing. But in the completeness of Doyle's devotion to catching the bad guys, to noticing as he does when he's in the nightclub early in the film with Roy Scheider, when he looks over at uh, the table and he says, that table's wrong, wrong being cop verbiage for they're engaged in some kind of illegal activities. Let's tail them. Let's find out. That's how the whole thing uh, starts to, to go down. Ironically, in The French Connection, it's Popeye's own innate criminality, his own willingness to do absolutely anything to get the job done. It's that kind of, I think, innate criminality allows him to be recognized by the Frenchman who, you know, like sees like, real recognizes real. And Popeye Doyle is all the way real himself. And as such, he's recognized by the criminals as one of their own. And that's how his cover gets blown. Also, the endings of these films are interesting to contemplate in relation to each other. In The French Connection, well, The French Connection people largely get away with it. You know, there's a bunch of type on screen at the end, and there's a lot of reduced and suspended sentences. Popeye and Russo are transferred out of narcotics. They're reassigned. Their careers are ruined. 
it's very much the dour ending of the 70s. And it's really not the hero maligned but righted the ship that's more of a 60s feeling ending to Bullet, which is released in 1968. It's remarkable just three to four years after that, the hopes and the dreams of the 60s have congealed on screen into this fatalistic sense of moral decay at the heart of society and at its institutions. And no wonder, look at the events that transpired as the dream of the 60s, seen with the right kind of eyes, as Hunter S. Thompson beautifully wrote, lapsed into this series of horrific assassinations and uh, moments where the American people began to lose faith and confidence in the institutions that supposedly are set up to protect and lift us up. Now, all three of these films, um, all three of these Peter Yates films, Robbery, Bullet, and Eddie Coyle, all rely on a very specific type of leading man, which is interesting if you do watch Bullet and Eddie Coyle and Robbery. Eddie Coyle is widely available, as is Bullet. As I said, Robbery, you're going to have to buy the physical media. They all require this lead actor who kind of gruffly leads through his actions and not his words. Ironically, Robert Mitchum is the most verbal of these three protagonists. And Mitchum is not a guy particularly known for his locution on screen. You know, he's a guy that acts with his fists. But he talks the most of these protagonists in these films. And as I said, each of these films is also distinguished by Yates's dedication to the locations and the forensic attention to detail that he provides in each of these films. In The Friends of Eddie Coyle, which follows Eddie Coyle, played by Robert Mitchum, a small town Boston wise guy. He's not even really a gangster. He's just really a, a he's not even a middleman. You know, he's a guy who drives a truck and gets arrested and is smart enough to keep his mouth shut. That's pretty much who he is. He is a middleman. He's he's moving guns between a gun sale, a gun seller, and other slightly higher up on the chain mobsters that are using them to rob banks. And the commitment to detail that Peter Yates et al. extended when they were preparing to shoot the Friends of Eddie Coyle involved consulting with a real wise guy, I believe from the Winter Hill Gang, the Whitey Bulger Gang that ruled Boston in this era and for many decades. In fact, the bank robbery scenes in Eddie Coyle are startling not for their cinematic complexity a la Michael Mann's incredibly staged Los Angeles bank robbery in Heat. The bank robbery scenes here are surprising because they basically afford you an actual blueprint in how to go about robbing a bank of these types in this specific era. And ironically, many de decades later, someone would try to use this film's blueprint to rob the same bank featured in the film. We'll talk about that in a minute. So it's funny that a Brit in Peter Yates, deeply experienced in the 60s British film boom, becomes the guy who directs these terse, sparse, impressively committed American crime procedural films, films which are really easily among the greatest of their type and era. And in listening to him uh, talk on the commentary track for the Friends of Eddie Coyle, I think it's because at a relatively early age as a filmmaker, he had a sense of what he responded to in material and he pursued that stuff. He didn't pursue other opportunities which might have made more career sense or at least more Hollywood career sense, but he didn't really feel drawn to that type of life. Now, of course, as happens in the course of a multi-decade directing career, he falls out of fashion or favor or falls out of style with Hollywood later, and he, he makes some films which probably veer off that narrow gauge zone of interest that led to films like Robbery, Bullet, Eddie Coyle, Breaking Away, The Dresser, uh, but that's life, right? The Deep. I haven't seen The Deep in a while. That's also a Peter Yates film. Nolte, you know, kind of post-Jaws, what else can we do underwater? Um, I'm curious to see. I'm, I'm going to look at, I'm going to eventually 
screen that and some other deeper cut Peter Yates films because I want to see if the stuff I like is always kind of present, even if maybe some of the other elements don't congeal and come together. So the way The Friends of Eddie Coyle came about in 1973 was that Yates, based on the success of Robbery, was under contract to Paramount for three films, two of which never got made. But Peter Bart, working for Robert Evans at the time, as discussed in my episodes about the making of The Godfather, Peter Bart sent him the George V. Higgins book, The Friends of Eddie Coyle. And again, this to me is, there's, there's Evans, who is the supernova that sucks all of the attention to himself and his position of importance, which no doubt has truth and realism to it. But in many instances, including the making of The Godfather, Peter Bart's contributions need to be recognized and singled out and are often the the match that lights the fuse. And in this case, he gave the book to Peter Yates, and it was exactly the type of thing that Peter Yates was familiar with, having done robbery, but also it was something different, doing it in America, doing it in Boston, learning this culture. This is the type of stuff that got Peter Yates going as a director. This is a film where nothing in the, in the film, The Friends of Eddie Coyle, nothing is shot at a studio. It's a low-budget film. It's made for three million bucks. He rehearsed the cast for two weeks, and then they're on location, real locations, a real bank, real bars, the government complex in downtown Boston. All these, all these real locations carefully cast and populated with brilliant collection of actors and with the help of a gangster who knew how to advise on really highly specific crime stuff of the sort you see in the film. And help from the FBI, who gave the other kind of help. Here's what we would be doing to catch these guys. It's very, very realistic. There's very few filmmaker flourishes. This allows you to disappear into the film. Simplicity is a word that Yates uses a lot. However, Friends of Eddie Coyle is one of those deceptively simple films. Once you experience it and you kind of start watching it for how it's put together, there are a lot of very complicated dialogue scenes and very complicated, uh, I hesitate to even call them action scenes because they don't play like that. Even the action feels like it's character based. So there's a very complex scene where Jackie Brown, guess who's a fan of the Friends of Eddie Coyle? Jackie Brown is the gun dealer played by the great uh, Stephen Keats in the film. There's a great scene where he is being pursued by uh, by the FBI agents, and they're watching him at a train station as he's going to transact a machine gun uh, deal with two of two two kind of machine gun desiring hippies who are going to rob banks. It's sort of a weather underground vibe feeling setup. It's such a complicated and interesting scene, but it plays so simplistically when you watch it. You watch it closely to admire the complexity. It never looks like anything but totally real. You know, another amazing thing that the Friends of Eddie Coyle has going for it is this great score by Dave Grusin. This is the theme. reminded of how much films of this era, crime films of this era, really rely on these incredible jazzy scores of their era, of the early 70s, and even in in Bullet of, of the 60s, which has this whole kind of jazz sequence. These are such important characters in the films. They really bring the the, the themes and the, the 
aspects of, of life that are being displayed on screen to the forefront through the use of this kind of great music. And Dave Grusin's score is fantastic all through the Friends of Eddie Coyle. Uh, now, here's a bunch of things I just wanted to get into that are so great. As I said, there's a who's who of brilliant character actors in this film, the Friends of Eddie Coyle. And I mean, it's just so hard to, um, to, to, to not cover, <laughs> to not cover all of them. So I'm going to try to cover them all a bit just because here, here's a brief rundown. You have Mitchum as Eddie Coyle, Peter Boyle as Dylan, who's this nefarious, uh, protagonist antagonist. You have Richard Jordan, the great Richard Jordan as the FBI guy. You have Stephen Keats as Jackie Brown. He's the gun runner. Alex Rocco, Mo Green himself. Joe Santos, not yet of the Rockford Files, playing a bit against type from how you know him. Jack Kehoe, the great Jack Kehoe. And James Tolkien, all occupying great roles to varying degrees in this film. Now, there's a funny use here. I love Alex Rocco, who, by the way, in addition to the the uh, the Winter Hill Gang member who advised the production, Alex Rocco himself was from a mob background in the Boston area. And he knew a lot of people. And his real name is Alessandro Federico Petricone Jr., and he knew some guys, let's say. And he brought that knowledge both to the film and to the research for the film. There's a great scene, again, I was talking about the procedural elements of, of the, the bank robbery as well. Here's a scene where Alex Rocco is casing a very simple, small town, Boston suburb bank. And there's a method to my madness here in playing this clip. He comes in and is scoping out the security apparatus and the impetus for him being in the bank is that he needs change for a 10. And again, because we're in a real bank, it's just, you, you couldn't set dress this any more perfectly than a real location. May I help you, sir? May I have change for 10? Yes, how would you like it? 10 singles would be fine. So that's the mechanism by which he's just now standing and looking at the security cameras. Counts out his 10 signals, which in a nice little bit of okay. filmmaking verisimilitude, you know, I had to use the word. I like that the shuffle count you can hear is actually a count of 10. Listen again. That's attention to detail, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate that. <laughs> so the reason I got into that, it was because another rabbit hole I've been going down recently is Saturday Night Live. I was a fan of the Nate Bargatze, Nate Bargatze episode and the brilliant George Washington sketch. I've also been listening a lot to Dana Carvey and David Spade's podcast, Fly on the Wall, which interviews most notable Saturday Night Live contributors and cast members, and they talk about their experiences on the show and what they all went through collectively. It's such a unique experience to do Saturday Night Live, it's such a unique part of American television history. It's uh, so unique that, of course, I'm obsessed with it. And when I saw Alex Rocco go in to the bank only to get change for a 10, like, He's not a pass holder at the bank. He doesn't have an account. He just needs change for a 10. That, of course, reminded me of the iconic Jim Downey written SNL sketch, Change Bank. I needed to take the bus, but all I had was a $5 bill. I went to First Citywide, and they were able to give me four singles and four quarters. We will work with the customer to give that customer the change that he or she needs. If you come to us with a $20 bill, we can give you two tens. We can give you four fives. We can give you a 10 and two fives. We will work with you. I went to my first citywide branch to change a 50. 
I guess I was in kind of a hurry. I asked for a 20, a 10, and two fives. Well, the computers picked up my mistake right away. I got the correct change. <laughs> That's just so good. <laughs> that, that reminded me completely of what Alex Rocco does in this film, Change Bank. Now, in addition to the real bank that is used as a location, there's a real police station. There's a supermarket parking lot outside of Boston that's a brilliant location. There's an incredible brutalist structure in this uh, lot uh, that the two kind of conspiring characters are meeting in. Um, the locations are amazing. In, in many ways, it's maybe the the most Boston movie ever made. It's the certainly one of the greatest period Boston films ever made. And unlike, say, uh, The Verdict, where it takes place in Boston, but many of the exteriors and interiors are actually from Brooklyn, everything here is where it says it is. And it does make a difference. So Alex Rocco was fantastic. The one guy I don't think is great, I have to say, and I love him, is James Tolkien. So in the setup of The Friends of Eddie Coyle, Dylan is played by Peter Boyle. He's amazing. It's such a good use of Peter Boyle's kind of off-kilter persona where you don't really know where he's coming from. I'm going to talk more about Peter Boyle and some of the other supporting cast members in a moment. But there's a scene where James Tolkien is from The Man. There's a reference. I got to go see The Man. Well, The Man is, is the, the, the mob patriarch. You don't mess with The Man. Now, the man is sending James Tolkien to tell Dylan, the Peter Boyle character, that something needs to be done about Eddie Coyle. And in a film that's so realistic, I don't know, Tolkien just, it's not a good use of him. This is the brutalist parking structure I was mentioning. I was wondering if you could handle something for us. More than likely. Depends, I suppose, but more than likely. This is pretty important. That's why we got in touch with you. Somebody have a problem? Jimmy Scal, Artie Valentropo, Fritzy Weber, and Phil Kenny. They got bagged in a house up in Milton there. Murder one hearing this afternoon. I warned him. Who warned who? Jimmy Scal. Picked up on something the other day. This guy, uh, the guy we know, me and the Scal. He's up for sentencing. It's almost a mandatory, you know? The name of Coyle, isn't it? I had him driving a truck for me and a fellow up there in New Hampshire there. And he got hooked. That's why he was coming up. <laughs> I was figuring he was thinking about dumping me. But he wouldn't do that unless he took out a will. So uh, he dumped on Jimmy and Artie, the bastard. Scal gave his lawyer that name, Coyle, to give to the man. Coyle, Eddie Fingers, right? You want him hit? The man wants him hit. Tonight. Now... One of the things is that in this scene, Peter Boyle is so tall that James Tolkien, who I think of in all of his towering film performances where he plays a bad guy or a loud voiced raging authority figure, he seems so tall and big, but, a, but opposite Peter Boyle, <laughs> he's so short. And I think that's why they put him in this hat and he's wearing this, this suit and he's eating. It just, it's not a great use of the Tolkien and, uh, it's the one false note in the casting. Reminded me, of course, of the great James Tolkien scene in Happy. Top Gun. Sir, how does it feel to be on the front page of every newspaper in the English-speaking world? Even though the other side denies the incident, congratulations. Thank you, sir. They gave you your choice of duty, son. Anything, any word. You believe that shit? Where do you think you want to go? I thought of being an instructor, sir. Top Gun? <laughs> yes, sir. God help us. <laughs> uh, that's more like James Tolkien, who I realize now in the scene is shorter than Tom Cruise. So that should have been a giveaway to me that, you know, Tolkien wasn't like six foot four. Now, here's what I wanted to say about Mitchum as we get into him in this film. And he is fantastic. It's, I think, probably Mitchum's greatest performance. He's the embodiment of everything we've just talked about. In, in a way, ironically, it's why I couldn't get into the film. The several times I tried to watch what was otherwise accurately recommended to me by every algorithm in the world that says, this movie ticks all of your boxes. 70s crime, British directors, naturalistic filmmaking, you know, 
all these films that I love from, from workman like directors like Don Siegel, it turns out that Mitchum's performance is so good. It almost doesn't register when you watch it the first time or even the first few times for me. But the more I watch him, the more impressive it is. And I think this is because it's not the type of 70s film acting that we became used to. It's not Redford or Newman. It's not uh, Pacino or De Niro. You know, Mitchum is from a different era. And his era was not about method acting and uh, verbiage and obsessive attention to his physicality. He just is. <laughs> and, and Yates says that Mitchum embodies everything you need in a film star, which is you want to watch him. And when he's not on screen, you miss him. Simplicity, thoughts behind the eyes and behind the line readings. And Mitchum is actively listening to all the other actors when they're in scenes together. And it seems to me that it's often then when Mitchum is listening and reacting that we learn the most about what makes Eddie Coyle tick. Here's a great scene between Stephen Keats as Jackie Brown, the gun dealer, and Eddie in one of the additionally fantastic locations. This is the bowling alley location. Barry, check out the mm. Just every frame of this film, Mitchum's eating a hot dog at a bowling alley. Hey. You owe me 10 more guns. I need them fast. When do I get them? Look, I got you the first batch when I said and I was ahead on the dozen. You know, these things take time. Time is what I haven't got. I'm getting pressure. I gotta see the man tomorrow night. I need those guns. I can't get them for you by tomorrow night. Son of a bitch, I gotta have that stuff fast. I got a long ride to make tomorrow night, and I need the stuff with me when I make it. No way. No way, no day, no can do. I told you, I get quality. These things take time. Tomorrow night. You aren't buying a loaf of bread, you know. I got a thing set up that works pretty good. Dependable stuff that's not gonna get anybody in trouble. I'm not gonna screw it up just because your people got hot drawers. You'll have to tell them that. You tell them. Look, the stuff will come. What's the big emergency? Look, one of the first things I learned is never to ask a man why he's in a hurry. All you got to know is I told a man that he could depend on me because you told me I could depend on you. Now, one of us is going to have a big, fat problem. Another thing I learned, if anybody's going to have a problem, you're going to be the one. You <laughs> this is so great. And what's amazing about this scene and Yates' direction of the scene, if you watch this movie, is that just before this part where he says, now listen, I told a guy I could depend on you because you told me I could depend on you, Yates makes a cut and Mitchum asks Jackie to walk over here to continue the conversation. It allows Yates to flip who's on the left side of the screen and who's on the right side of the screen. So in the previous part of the conversation, Jackie Brown, Stephen Keats character is on the left side of the screen and Mitchum is on the right. But once he walks him over, Mitchum is now on the left and he gets to deliver this little soliloquy here and again, this, his presence with Stephen Keats is so good. You know, I said he's not really a method type guy, but he is fully committed in these scenes. And he's, he did a trick on me. Like, I just couldn't get the performance at first. He's got a realism to him, but he's also aware of himself. There's a great scene uh, that takes place at an actual Boston Bruins hockey game. You piss, you piss. That's beer, God damn it! It's hard to carry beer in a crowd like this. You ever try it? This is the funny, just a funny random thing where he went to get th four beers for him and Dylan and this kid that's Dylan's nephew that are at the hockey game. And when he comes back, he's got like I guess this little stain on his crotch and. Dylan says, geez, when you piss, you really piss. And Mitchum goes into that little rant. It's hard to carry beers. You ever try it? And this scene contains what I was, a bit of what I was talking about before. I'm pretty sure it was filmed at a real hockey game. And the people around them are real. 
uh, they're not staring at the camera, but you can you can feel that they're really in an actual crowd shot. And this is such, turns out to be such a poignant little little moment that's almost a throwaway moment, where Eddie's talking about the genius of the great Boston Bruin, Bobby Orr. Can you imagine being a kid like that? What is he? 24 something? Greatest hockey player in the world. Number four, Bobby Orr. Jeez, what a future he's got, huh? And of course, the sad irony here is what a future Bobby Orr's got, but our friend Eddie Coyle because of his quote unquote friends, doesn't have much of a future. And again, that's kind of typical of this film where there's things that sort of happen and they feel purely conversational, but they're actually there for a very important and poignant reason. Now, unlike everybody else that surrounds him in this film, Mitchum imbues Eddie Coyle with a sense of regret for the double cross that he really is enacting or thinks he's enacting in the film. One of the funny things is just in those scenes I played, right? You have James Tolkien trying to press Peter Boyle to commit an assassination before Boyle's ready. He's like, Hey, I've got a process. I'm the best at this for a reason. You're asking me here. You're asking me to do this for the, for the reason that I do this particularly well. I can't rush this. Well, when Eddie Coyle needs the guns from Jackie Brown, He's pressing Jackie Brown to break his methodology in order to solve a problem that he has. All these characters are always scheming against each other. That's why the irony of the title, The Friends of Eddie Coyle. Well, it's The Friends of Eddie Coyle that spell doom for Eddie Coyle. Not that Eddie Coyle is pure. Like, that's what's really cool about the book and the film. There's a version of this where Eddie Coyle is just this kind of lunk-headed a uh, striver who's trying to go along to get along and is doing his part. He's not ratting out all the people he could rat out after getting popped driving the truck full of bootleg liquor in New Hampshire. He could do that, but he doesn't. However, he does end up ratting out uh, Jackie Brown, and he does end up attempting to rat out the bank robbery crew. But what he doesn't know is that Dylan has got there before him. Dylan is the Peter Boyle character is playing all the sides against the middle. And that's one of the fascinating things about the film too. But Mitchum is able to imbue Eddie with this sense of regret for what he's, what he has to do because we see Eddie's home life. We see his loving Irish wife, his kids. Um, and it's again, the sense that Mitchum had that McQueen had that, there's life written on their faces. There's inner life written on their faces. Everybody in every scene is hustling their scene partner. Probably only with the exception of Eddie and his wife. I can't think of any other scene, even when the, the feds are talking to each other, when the criminals are talking to each other, everybody's trying to get one over on someone else. The first meeting between Eddie Coyle and Jackie Brown is so great. Listen to the way Mitchum just asks for coffee here with his pie. They're meeting at this just perfectly <laughs> situated, I don't know what it is. Is it a coffee shop? It, it has this like hot table line. And Mitchum is served the most perfect piece of like a Boston cream pie. Listen to how he asks for his coffee. Coffee. It's a voice that needs coffee. And then behind him is a sign that says, uh, please line up, don't step out of line. It's like, it could be a prison. And he sits down with the leather jacketed gun dealer. He has a bite of his pie and his coffee. I mean, could you have any a more Robert Mitchum meal than pie and coffee? I can get your pieces by tomorrow night. I can get you probably six pieces. I got more now, but I promise some of this lot. I don't know as I like that. Buying from the same lot as somebody else. Makes me nervous. Yeah, well, I understand. You don't understand like I understand. I got certain responsibilities. But look, I told you I understand. Did you get my name or didn't you? I got your name. Well, all right. All right, nothing. I wish I had a nickel for every name I got that was all right. 
Look at that. You know what that is? Your hand. I hope you look closer at those guns than you did at that hand. Look at your own goddamn hand. Yeah. Count your fucking knuckles. <laughs> All of them? Count as many as you want. As many as you got, I got four more. You know how I got those? I bought some stuff from a man I knew his name. The stuff was traced. The guy I bought it for, he said MCI Walpole, 15 to 25, still in there. But he had some friends. I got an extra set of knuckles. They put your hand in the drawer, and somebody kicks the drawer shut. Hurt like a bastard. Jesus. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't deploy Mitchum better than this. I guess you can see a little bit of like why at first when I'm used to a certain kind of acting that didn't register for me. And I'm aware that it might even sound a little flat when you're listening to it. But I promise you, when you, when you look at him on screen, he will captivate you. There's so much going on. And George Higgins, who was a, uh, I believe he was a defense attorney or a prosecutor in Boston before he wrote this, which I believe was his first book. His whole thing is this extreme dedication to the way people talk. That's why it's so extraordinary that the, the film is so faithful to the book. Yates says very little of the book is not included on screen. He says, quote, I think you'll find every word spoken on screen is in the book. Having read the book in preparation for this, I can tell you that's true. Yates actually fought for Higgins to get an on screen written by credit not because he wrote the screenplay or even contributed to the screenplay, but because Yates was so aware himself of how faithful to the book the film ended up being. You know, in essence, the book is the screenplay. And as a result, he, he, he fought for, for Higgins to get a credit, which he was ultimately denied. Um, the production design, the cinematography, uh, Victor Kemper did the c cinematography. He's, he's still alive at, at 96 <laughs> he worked with Cassavetti, Sidney Lumet, Michael Ritchie, Lou Grossbard, Carol Rice, George Roy Hill, Norman Jewison, Carl Reiner, Richard Attenborough, Ilya Kazan, on and on and on. So many movies. Uh, Alice's Restaurant, Dog Day Afternoon, Slapshot, Coma, The Jerk, uh, The Four Seasons. Always love that movie. Um, on and on and on. The, the cinematography, and again, it's not stylish, it's not flashy, but it's so perfect. Then the locations that were found, there's a scene where Eddie Coyle is with his wife and there's this light string in their kitchen that hangs down in the middle of the frame. It's such a great choice. Most people would probably frame it that way and think like, well, this is weird. We have this string hanging between our two actors here. But it actually works perfectly. Not only does it sort of speak to the reality of the location where this conversation would really happen and a commitment to that. But it just, it lends itself to these locations in such a phenomenal way. Um, there's a, like I said, there's not a lot of action, but there are tense set pieces sometimes. There's a nighttime gun exchange between Jackie Brown, the Stephen Keats character, who we just heard talking to Mitchum, and these army guys who are stealing the M16s from the military and then selling them to Jackie Brown. And the first time you watch the film, there's this nighttime gun exchange that's so great because you don't know watching it for the first time if it's going to go as Jackie Brown plans it to go or not. And he's this cocky, flashy guy who drives this lime green muscle car and there's a tension that's so inherent to the kind of small time crime shit that we're dealing with here. And it doesn't make more of what it is, but it also doesn't make less of what it is. And watch again, particularly to the supermarket parking lot handover scene between Jackie Brown and Mitchum. Watch Mitchum's eyes watching Keats in that scene where Mitchum is using groceries as a delivery mechanism for the guns. Watch him watching Keats. It's, it's phenomenal. That's what I'm saying. Like, I missed a lot of the genius of Mitchum's performance the first time through. Um, 
Richard Jordan plays the cop here. He's such a such a great um, screen presence who I've always enjoyed. Um, you probably remember him from Hunt for Red October. Here's a little of him in that. You slammed the door on the general pretty hard, Jack. That was not my intention, sir. Oh, yes, it was. He was patronizing you and you stomped on him. My opinion, he deserved it. Listen, I'm a politician, which means I'm a cheat and a liar. And when I'm not kissing babies, I'm stealing their lollipops. But it also means that I keep my options open. So, let's assume for a minute that you're right and this Russian intends to defect. What do you suggest we do about it? We definitely grabbed the boat, sir. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. We're not talking about some stray pilot with a MiG. We're talking about several billion dollars worth of Soviet state property. <laughs> They're gonna want it back. Maybe it's enough then just to get some people on board and inspect it. Call it whatever you want to, a, a Coast Guard safety inspection. So how do we proceed? Well, first we would need to contact the commanders in the Atlantic directly. The Russians get one whiff of this through the regular communication circuits, the game is up. Second, we need to figure out what can we do to help them. We need to devise a plan to intercede, ready to go at a moment's notice. And third, somebody's got to go out there and make contact with Ramius and find out what his intentions really are. Okay, when do you leave? <laughs> Wait a minute. The general was right. I am not field personnel. I am only an analyst. You're perfect. I can't ask any of these characters to go. One, they don't believe in it. Two, they'd never stick their reputation on a hunch. Whereas you... Are... Now, <laughs> what's hilarious that occurs to me watching this, does anyone speak in lists? One, we do this. Two, we inform the generals directly. Three, we concoct a plan. You're perfect. One, no one would suspect you. Two, <laughs> such a screenwriter convention. <laughs> but this is a great two-hand scene here in The Hunt for Red October. Richard Jordan opposite Alec Baldwin. And it's the kind of just committed character-based work that he always does in every film that you ever see him in. And he is used a little bit against type in The Friends of Eddie Coyle, where he's so young. I think it's one of his very first films. He actually is a Harvard guy, but he's playing this kind of greasy-haired, uh, leather-jacketed fed, and he does a great job. Um, he was also in... What do you want to see Mr. Prescott about? The Secret of My Success. Are you a fan of this Michael J. Fox nephew. film? Like I am? Oh. Um, well, why don't you have a this is a This is I'll a great kind of Mr. bad schedule. 80s film. Anyway, here you're playing more to the Richard Jordan type that I think he more frequently did, which is kind of like... Mr. Prescott will see you Playing now. the oily, um, untrustworthy type. He kind of made a right to the specialty point. of those characters. I need a job, Uncle Howard. Around here, I'm Mr. Prescott. What can you do for us, Brantley? What experience have you had? Kind of sounds like Willem Dafoe. Practically none. But I believe in myself. Doesn't that count for something? Deep inside, I know I can do anything if I just get a chance. Think back to when you were my age. Remember how you felt when you went after that first job? Remember how you wanted it so badly you couldn't sleep the night before the interview? Remember how crushed you were when the guy said, what kind of experience have you got? You wanted to shake your fists and say, I can do anything if I can just get a chance. They're ready for you in the boardroom, Mr. Prescott. Call Bates and personnel. Tell them I'm sending somebody down. I don't know why I had to play that. I just wanted to revisit the secret of my success and the ludicrously named character Brantley. Who names a character Brantley? Anyway, that's great. Anyway, Richard Jordan's fantastic in this. Peter Boyle, as I mentioned, uh, such an interesting on-screen presence. You remember him from so many things. Maybe everybody loves Raymond. Uh, I always remember him as the wizard in Taxi Driver. 
street smarts imparted here to the increasingly unhinged Travis Bickle. This is such a great use of Boyle's 70s-ness, I think. Yeah? Well, I know you and I ain't talked too much, you know? Yeah. But I figure you've been around a lot, so you could... Yeah, shoot, that's why they call me the wizard. I got... It's just that I got a... I got a... Things got you down? Yeah. yeah okay. That happens to the best of... Yeah, I got me real down, real down. I just want to go out and, and, you know, like really, really, really do something. Taxi life, you mean? Yeah, well, nah, it's, I don't know. I just want to go out. I really, you know, I really want to, I got some bad ideas in my head, I just can't. Uh, look, look at it this way, you know, uh, a man, a man takes a job, you know, and that job, I mean, like that, you know, that becomes what he is, you know, like, uh, you know, you do a thing and that's what you want. I mean, like, I've been a, a cabby for 17 years, you know, 10 years at night. I still don't own my own cab. You know why? Because I don't want to. I must be what I what I want, you know, to be on the night shift, driving somebody else's cab. You understand? Uh, I mean, you, you, you become, you get a job, you, you become the job. I mean, like, one guy lives in Brooklyn. One guy lives in Sutton Place. You get a lawyer. Another guy's a doctor. Another guy dies, another guy gets well, and, you know, people are born. I envy you, you youth. Go on, get laid. Get drunk, you know, you can do anything. Because you got no choice anyway. I mean, we're all fucked. More or less, you know? So, that's such an important scene in the in the devolvement of Travis Bickle's psyche in a way. And it's Peter Boyle who's perfectly used. He's trying to help, but he's also giving him absolutely the worst possible advice that you could give Travis Bickle in this moment in his life. Uh, but man, Peter Boyle such a great actor and had such an amazing career. Um, he's so good. I was reading a little bit about him and you know, he made this film called Joe that I really want to see, which is this kind of very dark, cynical, nihilistic um, take on violence in society. And Peter Boyle's a very sensitive guy. When he saw audience members cheering the violence in Joe that's meant to be a cautionary tale, he refused to appear in any other film or television show that glorified violence. This included the role of Popeye Doyle in The French Connection. That role would earn Gene Hackman the Oscar. Uh, but he played this, this character in The Friends of Eddie Coyle, which doesn't really have any violence, although he is a killer. And he does commit an act of violence in the film. Um, and certainly he appeared in Taxi Driver, which is probably the most, one of the most violent films ever made. So, um, but Boyle is such an intriguing and sinister presence in The Friends of Eddie Coyle because he's the guy playing everyone against themselves. And he emerges unscathed with the Fed played by Richard Jordan at the end of the film. Two other great guys I have to mention. The great Jack Kehoe, who has just one scene in The Friends of Eddie Coyle. He's one of the guys who's getting the guns for the Jackie Brown character. And whenever I see Jack Kehoe, I feel so warmly towards him because of his great delivery in this scene from Midnight Run. Moscones, bail bonds. Jerry. That's Jack Kehoe phone. playing Jerry. Jack, what's the progress? I got him. You got him. The Duke, he's standing right here. You got him? Already? Sure do. 
Yeah, Jerry's listening in on this phone call here between between De Niro and Joey Pantoliano. And also the feds are listening outside. And what's brilliant is the way Jack Kehoe delivers this oily line because we know he's he's a rat. He's going to to rat out what's going on here unbeknownst to his boss, Joe Pantoliano. And here's how he does that right here. So what's that all about? Jerry Walsh got the Duke! Walsh got the Duke? He got him! He got the Duke! No kidding? This calls for a celebration. I get some donuts. <laughs> I get some donuts. With the cigarette, the way he's pointing, it's... That's acting, my friends. That's just brilliant. And of course, I would be remiss not mentioning Mo Green since we talked about Alex Rocco. How do you know that? His iconic scene. Hey, Mike. Hello, fellas. Everybody's here. Freddie, Tom, good to see you, Mike. How are you, Mo? All right. You got everything you want? The chef cooked for you special. The dancers will kick your tongue out, and your credit is good. Drug chips for everybody in the room so they can play in the house. Yeah. My credit good enough to buy you out? <laughs> <laughs> buy me out. Casino. The hotel. Corleone family wants to buy you out. The Corleone family wants to buy me out. No, I buy you out. You don't buy me out. Your casino loses money. Maybe we can do better. You think I'm skimming off the top, Mike? You're unlucky. <laughs> you goddamn guineas really make me laugh. I do you a favor and take Freddie in when you're having a bad time, and then you try to push me out. Wait a minute. You took Freddie in because the Corleone family bankrolled your casino because the Molinari family on the coast guaranteed his safety. Now, we're talking business. Let's talk business. Yeah, let's talk business, Mike. First of all, you're all done. The Corleone family don't even have that kind of muscle anymore. The Godfather is sick, right? You're getting chased out of New York by Bazzini and the other families. What do you think is going on here? You think you can come to my hotel and take over? I talked to Bazzini. I can make a deal with him and still keep my hotel. Is that why you slap my brother around in public? Okay, I have to stop down on the worst re-recorded line of dialogue in film history. I talked to Barzini. Listen to how it doesn't match at all, even a little bit. Father's sick, right? You're getting chased out of New York by Barzini and the other families. Right here. What do you think is going on here? You think you can come to my hotel and take over? I talked to Barzini. I- <laughs> it's recorded in like a completely different space than the one this brilliant scene is in. And let's give props to Alex Rocco for going toe-to-toe with the scary version of Michael Corleone here. Because Michael has changed. He's got his three-piece suit, his cigarettes. Mo Green is not a man to be trifled with, as Fredo cautions his own brother. It's also interesting that you have Alex Rocco, who is an actual Italian-American playing a Jewish mobster in this scene. And then also in The Godfather, you have James Kahn, who is actually a Jewish man playing an Italian American mobster in a, in a role that would cause him to be mistaken for Italian the entirety of his life. <laughs> he, he was not at all Italian. So that's the great Alex Rocco. Um, so the friends of Eddie Coyle, I want you to check it out. It's, uh, it's got so many charms. It's got such a unique way of being itself And I really think that fans of the podcast probably already love this film more than I did. It took me until recently to get into this film, I'm embarrassed to say. But once I got into it, uh, I'm I'm fully embracing it and I'm continuing to watch more and, and different Peter Yates films and really appreciating him as a director. So check out some of the films that I've talked about in this episode. And I will be back to talk with you next week about more films from the sweet spot of the Full Cast and Crew podcast.